for taking the time and appreciating our panel taking their time to be with us this evening. Um, before we get started and before I introduce the panelists and we get going on our discussion, um, I'd like to recognize a couple of members of our audience. So if I call your group, would you please stand so that we can recognize you? Uh, is there anyone here who is a legislator or is representing the legislator's office this evening? Okay. How about board members? I know we have a few board members in the room. Would you mind standing, please? Okay, so we have Mr. Oz, Mr. Culver, Mr. Freeman. Thank you very much, Mr. Bay. Mr. Busantri, Mr. Fumo. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We appreciate it. How about our township supervisors? Anyone here from the township? And our first responders, I know some of you are new here this evening. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. And how about our school administrators, if you wouldn't mind standing, please? I know you're here. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you. So, for our panel, um, I wanted to get a read on the rest of the audience. Oh, I did already. Casey Kohler, I'm sorry, from the IU, if you wouldn't mind standing up and being with us, please. Casey helps us with um, pulling together a group of on the S3 Council, so we work on safety and security as a county, and Casey is responsible for pulling that group together, so thank you for mentioning him, but thank you for standing. Um, now, for our panelists, let's get a read on the rest of the audience, if you don't mind. How about parents, grandparents, community members, if you wouldn't mind? Standing, please. Thank you. All right. Finally, we need to stay focused on educating the whole child. 
to be aware and to continue to monitor concerns that affect educating our students. Once again, thanks to the panel and for all of you for attending. So the question that we asked all of our uh, presenters to talk about is what recent trends are you seeing regionally, nationally, from your perspective that affect school and community safety and security? So that's a sort of a mouthful, but what are you seeing in your line of work? One of the things that we see, uh, unfortunately, are copycats. And, and I don't want to sound like an alarmist, but any time that we have a school violence incident, particularly a mass shooting incident, we won't have other people shooting, but we will have a lot of threats. Um, and with the prevalence of social media, those threats can be made very frequently all hours at inopportune times and anonymously. And I think that um, as a result of that, what we're also seeing, um, I think it's important for everybody to make a report. If you see something or hear something or your child uh, is not sure, you need to encourage them to communicate with you. That's going to be a, a message that I'm going to preach a lot tonight, but is to report it to uh, Matt or report it to Mike with the state police and let us sort it out, let us determine whether or not the threat is real, how real it is, whether this may be somebody that's in crisis, somebody that might be uh, some kind of attention, mental health or social uh, assistance, or whether they've committed a crime. But one of the other things that I have seen sort of as a corollary to that is uh, the schools really have a zero tolerance policy, and I'm not going to comment whether that's good or bad, I think every school has to be answerable to its constituents, but we are getting a lot of um, a lot of complaints where the schools have taken action where it might not necessarily be a crime, but the school has seen fit to make sure to ensure that everybody is safe and that is number one. The other thing that I'll just mention is we have a tendency always to think that uh, the school threats may come from the students within or uh, past students. And that's not always the case. The other things that we need to make sure that we are protecting our kids and our, our community and the schools from are <clears throat> people that may use the school after hours. Look at us right here. There's a couple hundred of us here. We don't all go here. In all candor, this is something that I'm sure that the guys at the end of the table here have probably done a scan. Uh, that's something that we're not necessarily mindful of. We're very focused, narrowly focused on the health and safety of our children, and then that, that those threats may necessarily come from there, and that's not always the case. So I know in about five minutes, I'm sure I'll be asking the comments and further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And John? Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I, I, I'll quickly explain this. There are a few human services. You see people often know what that means. It means I, I oversee the, the mental health, the drug and alcohol, the child welfare, the aging, uh, the health, housing services, intellectual disability services for the county. And that puts me in a position to try to help connect those various services with each other. Um, I think one of the trends that we're seeing nationally in human services is both the trend and the challenge of trying to get these various systems working together and talking to each other. Because, and, and I appreciate the gentleman, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, who introduced um, us tonight and who spoke about trying to address the whole child. And I think that means the whole child and the whole family, right? And the whole really looking at across the various components of their lives. And so, although there might be mental health issues in the home, there might be anxiety, there might be Concerns is that coming from a mental health perspective, or is it coming from from uh, concerns about somebody having lost their job? Um, is it is it limited homelessness? Is it lack of transportation? Is it substance use disorder? Is it uh, a variety of other social determinants of health areas that really impact the lives of the child and impact the life of the family? And being able to look at the child and the family all together holistically them, is both a trend and a challenge. Because the challenge of there comes around uh, being able to share information from these various systems. And so we'll probably talk a little later again about some of those challenges. But being able to work together and work as a team and look at the whole child is really, or the whole family, um, is really something that we're trying to do more and more. And I 
think those conversations are happening uh, at a lot of levels, um, which brings in another sort of trend and challenge is some of the bureaucracy. The line here is this county government. Um, there's been a lot of focus on school safety at the federal level, at the state level, us at the county level. Um, I got more involved in this discussion this summer. I think it started with Matt and the uh, commissioner, one of the commissioners having a conversation about what can we do at the county level to help and are wanting to get involved and are wanting to help and are wanting to make sure that um, that the different components of schools, safety, mental health, are talking to each other and what can we do to help that. And uh, we realized at the county level, the best thing we could do would be to help support um, schools and districts more at the local level. That people weren't going to come to me and say, can you help, uh, help solve this problem? It was more going to have to be the local chiefs, the local districts, the local mental health professionals working with each other. And so um, I guess the trend that I'm going to talk about is our one of the help support that tonight. How do we help support the uh, integration of these services, the communication between these services? Um, I'm going to leave the trends around mental health for mental health experts, um, but uh, I, I guess where I wanted to start tonight is really putting that on the table to everybody figuring out how we team and work together and solve problems together. Um, there's a phrase I use with my team a lot, which is that the power of the idea has to be more important than the idea of power. So how do we work together, worrying less about our own individual role, and how do we sort of support as a team the family and the child.
we're anxious about something. We live in a very, very anxious world right now. Um, and that's what I've seen kind of increase over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing wrong with seeking help. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. Um, and there's lots of different ways to get it. And there's lots of things that people can do that are not necessarily um, cured with the medication or cured with you know years of therapy or anything like that. It, there's very simple things that people can do every day just to help de-stress a little bit. And I think that if by helping people be able to do that, a lot of the mental health uh, concerns that people talk about can be reduced. So that's what we try to focus on uh, in our family-based services is really helping the entire family create a mindful awareness of what might be taking place for them and then find concrete and simple ways to address it that anybody can do. If I could, may I just ask, uh, just for clarification, when you talk about organizations, agencies working together, uh, for me, for the audience, can you, can you elaborate on that just for a moment? Okay. Okay. <coughs> um, well, I would, just speaking from, from family services, I know that we, we come in and we work with families with their third child, we're working with the child, we're working with caregivers. Um, I always say to people, you know, we have case management as part of our program because we want to make sure that there's a consistent message uh, being passed to other people and that everyone is kind of on the same page with how to interact with somebody. Um, this communication happens all the time. It's so easy for it to happen with no malice on any side of anything. And uh, I think our families are the people who end up getting lost in that. Um, I've also been fairly active with Bucks County Mental Health and working with Children Youth Services. Again, and just trying to smooth out uh, our communication patterns. Uh, you'd be amazed how the easiest thing is just um, turning these really big problems where we could just get to a table and actually talk about it and have a, a simple conversation, which we do, we did. Um, solutions are there, you know, so having everyone on the same page to really understand the whole child, the whole family, is key to uh, being able to find a, a whole solution, I think. Thank you. And if I could maybe just add to that, because again, agencies is a word that I use a lot, it's a little bit of my role, we use work with a lot of community-based <coughs> organizations and great community providers, but I think we're also talking about the physician's offices mm -hmm. and the schools, um, law enforcement, and the various um, organizations that, that come into contact with the children and families and creating sort of seamless uh, uh, supports of care around that child and around that family is part of the challenge that I was that I was referring to, and and I think you're right. What we're we can talk about even if you're just talking about human service agencies or just talking about mental health providers, when when there's a transition from a higher level of care to a lower level of care like that, what this, the, the, what happens to that child or that family doesn't always transition from one provider to another, and we can't let those gaps and those seams prevent us from really being able to support that family. Thank you, Don. Uh, my name is Jim Thomas. I'm a sergeant uh, station commander at Dublin. I've been at Dublin since uh, February, um, and mainly full-time uh, this past summer, beginning in June. I want to thank Palisades uh, for having this event, and uh, I look forward to being here, and I thank you for the invite. Because I think, you know, part of the things that we need to do as a community, these are the type of uh, settings we need to have. Right? Because I think it's too late. If we do have a crisis, um, we can't exchange business cards at that point. We need to have meetings. We need to talk and we need to learn best practices and, and get a feel for what the community has to say. And I, I think that's valuable. And I think this is a, a, a great forum for that. Uh, you know, a couple of things that I, I'd like to talk about. Uh, you know, some of the positives uh, and instead of talking about negative trends. And, and from my vantage point, I haven't really seen things. Uh, as I look at statistics from the past year or two in PSB Dublin in our area, and I don't really see anything trending uh, in, a, in a negative uh, uh, light. Uh, some of the positives that uh, we've been doing in, in Dublin and uh, working with the schools and building relationships, uh, one of the things we, we do domestic security checks now, um, we, we spent uh, uh, over 420 times a month, okay, because I know I look at the stats. We have police officers showing up at schools. In fact, Trooper Phillips is in the back row there. Uh, he's here at the school right now. He's conducting a domestic security check. It's something that we take very seriously. 
and uh, we're going to continue to do that. So I mean that's a positive. We we, we were here at all the opening uh, day for all the all the students, right? Police officers were here um, and uh, meeting with students, uh, welcoming them to their first day, uh, and uh, we continue to do that. Uh, I encourage my officers, my troopers, to uh, spend time at the schools and uh, get to know the staff, get to know the buildings, get to know the layouts. Uh, so that's that's positive. Uh, one of the other positive things that we do, and, uh, and, and Trooper Bill Griffith, who, who's here, uh, he does a lot of the active shooting training, uh, active shooter training. So we, we spend time at the schools, we work on drills every year, uh, two drills a year, and he spends time working with staff and uh, students uh, and uh, teachers and providing uh, the necessary training so they can be prepared. One of the other things I, I think positive that we've been implementing at Dublin is uh, we do this thing called the bus with the cop. I think it's a big win. Uh, we, we have a we have a uh, big different routes every month. Right, uh, we're working on two two a month. We put a trooper on the bus with the children, and uh, we uh, also have an unmarked vehicle following the school bus looking for violations. At the completion of that. The, the, the troopers go in with the kids into the school, right? Walk around the schools, mm -hmm. talk to kids, and uh, I think it's another positive, another positive trend. I, I think that those are the trends that we're seeing, not just in our area, but probably across America. I think it's important that we need to build these relationships with communities, with schools, and, uh, and law enforcement is a big, big piece of it. Um, some of the other um, uh, trends that I see, you know, coming up is, you know, this world. It's an uncertain environment, right? These attacks are, are, are changing in scale. Uh, they're very disruptive, uh, and, and things that occur in our schools. Uh, so I think there's going to be a need for it, and, and, and we're already working on that um, assessments. And I, and I know my colleagues on my left, he's involved with doing assessments of schools, and the state police is getting more involved, and we're building a couple more uh, uh, assessment teams to conduct assessments of schools. I guess in closing, I don't want to take up too much more time with the five minutes, but I think really it begins with uh, um, you know collaboration and, and, and building uh, something together and working with the community because you know as, as police officers and I think my colleagues might have to tell you that you know we're not going to be able to be everywhere at all times, and so we rely on the community quite a bit to provide details, to provide information. And I think it's so important that we pay attention to what our children are doing on social media so we can get that information involved at, at the early stage instead of waiting till the crisis actually happens. So once again, I thank you for inviting me. I, I appreciate being here. And, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't have a bio. And, uh, <laughs> next time. Yeah, next time, time my picture is attached. We'll use our imagination. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you.
to more of how we identify, and this is really the challenge, how do, how do we identify these potential violent actors? Uh, because there's no profile if you look at the statistics other than they're generally male. They come from all different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, different levels of education. Um, so really what we need is the community's help identifying ahead of time some of who these potential actors are. Um, how do we do that? We can talk about that more in some of the other questions. Um, but when you look at the different FBI studies, generally these aren't these aren't crimes that somebody just snaps and decides to do this and then the next day these uh, types of crimes occur. There's usually times where there's planning, there's preparation, and those will be the times where information gathered by friends, family members, co-workers might be able to help us prevent something, uh, you know, another tragedy. So I'd like to echo a lot of the statements that the sergeant has made. I don't see any locally um, negative trends which is a good thing for our community. We have a real strong support community and great relationship with the school district. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Mike? I'm Chief McDonald from Springfield Township Police. Um, I guess it comes with the territory of going last here, but uh, to, to echo um, a lot of the panel's comments, uh, I think the general gist of the trends that I'm seeing is we're moving from a reactive type of um, study or response to acts of violence in the schools to a proactive that comes in the form of the school assessments, uh, just putting cops in near schools, whether it be an official SRO type program, police officer that's that's stationed in the school for the entire school day uh, or like Springfield Township does is put an officer up in the parking lot or very nearby uh, pretty much every morning uh, unless an emergency call comes in we're in the area um, or within earshot of the school um, and at least once a week our guys go through the school we walk around and interact with the staff teachers and, and more importantly students um, you know we're as law enforcement are constantly changing our training based on the uh, as sort of Thomas explained the scale and diversity of the attacks I mean, this, back in the late 90s in 1998 when Columbine happened it was school shooter, what happens in a school shooter type of situation. Um, and since then, we've seen so many different types of attacks, we kind of just have to open our mind to the what ifs and, and role play on a constant basis. Um, and you have everything from the, the school shootings to using chemicals, the acid attacks, uh, edged weapons, vehicle attacks, not just speaking to the schools, but um, we have a lot of kids going in and out of the schools at any particular time, uh, especially drop off and, and pick up. And we've all seen the, the news where people are driving their vehicles into a crowd of people. So our training and our um, the process of planning for these responses on the long run have to take into consideration a diverse amount of, of uh, attack potentials. And I think the school assessment program is great. We've been involved with a bunch of those. And kudos to Palisade School District. They're on top of it. I don't want to go as far as to say whatever we say they do, uh, because obviously there's a delicate balance in what law enforcement wants versus what the school and parents want. Um, but I think it's been a great collaboration of those resources to get together and coming up with a plan um, and being open to changing that plan. I think that's a big thing, is, is just being open-minded and willing to adjust, as 
as the trends change, because they're going to change. The copycat syndrome goes from copycat to I'm going to be a copycat and then I'm going to add to that. One thing that's in common with a lot of these attackers is they want the thing. They, they want to do something different. Uh, they know what worked before, but they also want their own spotlight. So they're changing it up. And a lot of time, hopefully we can be one step ahead of them, but a lot of time, unfortunately, we're not. So <coughs> with information sharing and, uh, and social media, which is a blessing in disguise in some, in some aspects. Um, you know, we, we try to monitor that as best we can while balancing the privacy rights of the citizens. It's, it's a very delicate balance. If we could watch every Facebook post out there, then we'd probably curb a lot of activity, but that's just not going to happen anytime soon. Right, so we rely on community and sure. students. To yeah. yeah. And you know how it works. Friends of, I don't know, Facebook. I've been told they have all these friends and things, and you know, I, I can't just log on to Facebook and look at all these these posts. But um, the see something, say something concept really comes into play. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Kasher, are you Um, so I think from the school perspective, two of the trends over the past 10, 15 years have been our physical plan. Um, the buildings, well, the building that you're sitting in now was built 25 years ago, and it was not built um, necessarily with safety and security in mind when it was built at a different purpose. So even as you walked in, some of the changes to physical plan have been the main office area, so there's better cycle lines out into the parking lot, for example. We had our high school students that are videoing us now take a tour of the, uh, the office and, and see the changes there. So we rely on our partners uh, to my left to help us with those types of physical plant changes that are necessary to keep our kids safe. Um, so we continue to do walkthroughs. We've been doing walkthroughs for at least 10 years, I would say, um, oftentimes more than once a year, and every time we make an improvement. So we take the um, feedback that we receive from our community members and make it more secure, make improvements that are recommended. We also heard about mental health, so another area that schools are focusing on for the training that we're providing to our teachers and our staff on mental health. So we have youth mental health first aid training that we have conducted with our faculty and staff. We're looking at um, and learning more about what it means to be trauma-informed. Um, in our schools and our educational practices. And I also want to share too as far as trends, um, and this will be launched in January as per uh, Act 44, but it's a program called Safe to Say, and it will be a statewide anonymous reporting system that's run out of the Auditor General's office. So tips from anywhere throughout the state, well, from anywhere, with if it affects the school in Pennsylvania, we'll be driven to the Auditor General's office, they'll do, they'll triage that um, report that comes through, and then it will go to both law enforcement and to the schools to make them aware. That really is a community effort um, to make that, well, to pull it off, but also to train those that will be responding to those crisis situations and both law enforcement and schools being made aware of it. So those are just a few things that I wanted to share as far as trends in schools, training, and physical space changes. Okay. Great. So the next question that we have for all of you is, what is the biggest challenge? And you, you've each touched on some of them. Um, I'd like you to also maybe talk about, and, and you might have alluded to this as well, uh, but let's ask you again, specifically what changes have you made in your department or in your organization um, to sort of address those challenges? So what are, what, what are you seeing and, and how have you, you know, moved the, changed the course of the ship to, to address those situations? Okay? So let's start with Matt and John, representing the Catholics. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have is the uh, the blessing and a curse, I think Mike alluded to this, is 
the information that we have at our fingertips is constant and it's, it's a barrage. And one of the things that I've observed is that when there is this outpouring of information, let's say from a reliable source like the school district, they put out a blast to say, hey, the school is on lockdown for, for some safety reason. I think the tendency for the parents is to try to rush in, to try to contact their children, to try to become uh, an individual participant. And that is the exact opposite of what law enforcement and what the schools would like to have happen. But I think it's a natural reaction. If uh, I were to get a text from my child, I probably would react the same way. And I'm, I am urging you to please use restraint and understand that when we are sending out a blast like that of information, that's because we know way more than we're telling you. And we just want you to understand that we, have, we are aware of the situation and are taking affirmative action to try to, to make sure that your children are safe. The second thing that I would like to touch on is something I think John hit, up, hit upon, and we actually got all the, thanks to Casey Fowler in the back there, we got all the superintendents and all of the police chiefs in one room, and that was a lot of alcohols in one room, let me tell you. Uh, but it was great because one of the issues that we have is every school district does things differently, and every police agency does things differently throughout the county. <clears throat> So we, we had a concern that God forbid there's some kind of a mass emergency or event where we need everybody all hands on deck to respond from all over all police agencies. Let's just say Palisades had an issue here. It wouldn't only be the three departments that are represented at the table, it would be people from all over and we need to have some uniformity and consistency uh, in, in the responses. So, I love Alice, there's also another program, Run, High Fight, and they, they both have their pros and cons, but if the police aren't trained uniformly on how to respond in either of those situations, it could cause miscommunications and problems. Uh, so that is something that we are trying to do to unify together, to have some just universal guidelines and directives. We can't mandate your school district to do certain things, just like we can't mandate the police to do certain things. But it sure would help if everybody were reading from the same page. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. John, do you have a comment? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll touch on two um, challenges. Uh, one in this area of the information sharing, but uh, Matt was talking about it in terms of um, posting, and I want to talk about it in terms more of prevention. And are, as I talked about earlier, trying to work together um, at that same event that Matt was talking about with the school districts and law enforcement were all together. We also had our mental health administrator and we had also got a letter from uh, the president judge right, who, who said to us, I want you all as professionals to know that in these dire situations, if you really have a situation that you feel like you need to talk to each other, and that is emphasized this to us too, that we should be able to do that. And um, I want to make myself clear with this group tonight. We are very respectful of people's individual rights. We don't, there's a lot of, uh, I mentioned earlier, regulations, HIPAA, which prevents uh, information about people's health being shared. There's, there's CHIRPA, which prevents, the, the, talks about how law enforcement can share information. FERPA, which talks about how schools can share information or not information, not share information. And we want to be respectful for all those laws and people's individual rights and confidentiality. But we also never want to have a situation where, um, as Matt said, God forbid we ever have a shooting or a situation where and then we all look at each other afterwards and said, well, we all knew, but we never talked to each other. So how do we put ourselves in a situation where if we really feel this, this and not, certainly not talking about every child or every case or every uh, thing like the SAP team is dealing with, but really that one case where if a law enforcement officer is saying, this is going to be the school shooter in our community, that we can talk to each other, that we can share what's happening with school and mental health and what's happening with law enforcement. What do we know? about a situation that we can share that doesn't violate, we're not going to give anybody's case notes out or what they said to a therapist, but what can we share about a particular situation to, to work together to prevent? And I think it's important that the different systems are talking to each other. And again, it's, uh, I want to make sure that I'm communicating clearly to this group tonight, to the parents in the room, that this is not, um, this is only in those most extreme of cir circumstances. How do we work together um, to share information without violating anybody's individual rights to privacy? And we're very conscious of that in all of our systems. 
So that is something that we are, that's a challenge. And that's something that we are committing to working together, but we're still working a little bit on the rules of the road about what, what, what might be shared. Um, the other challenge I want to talk about, and I think uh, uh, I more than mentioned, is this phrase stigma. That I think as we start talking about mental health, when we talk about it in the context of school safety, we have to be very careful, right? Because we don't want to put ourselves as a community in a situation where people don't want to seek mental health treatment, or where they feel like, oh, if I seek mental health treatment, they're going to think the next thing is I'm going to come and shoot up the school or what have you. We want people in our community to need those helps and supports to feel like they can get it, to feel like they can talk about it, to feel like they can rely on their friends and their family. So we need to destigmatize uh, people's need for mental health treatment. I think you do see that as you commercials, you see celebrities, you see that more on the national level. But at the local level, it's very hard for anybody to admit that they need help. And it's very hard, even harder now to say, um, I, I need mental health treatment if you're worried that you're going to be assessed and, and institutionalized. That we really have to help people understand that we all need help at different times. And that a lot of people seek treatment. And um, the last thing I'll mention in regards to that, of challenge of destigmatizing mental health, as I appreciate what Dr. O'Connell talked about being trauma informed. And that's something at the county we talk a lot about. And that, that is really trying to, instead of saying um, to somebody, you know, what's wrong with you, that we say, you know, what happened to you? What caused you to behave this way or feel this way? And for help, if more matter of us as professionals understanding what led, so, led somebody to, to a particular point in their life, and to help them overcome that versus pointing fingers and saying, you know, what's wrong with that person? And we have to all be a little bit more trauma-informed as we approach people in our community and, and try to destigmatize mental health while also taking the safety and security of our schools seriously. Thank you. Um, and just for the audience, I mean, we're talking about, you know, community and building and supports. Uh, as a school district, certainly we throw out a lot of acronyms. You may or may not be aware. SAP is a student assistance program. And so that is a team of teachers and professionals who are coming together to support students who need uh, additional support. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. Again, we throw out tons of acronyms. And so I have three if I know what it is, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so do you want to take this, uh, Lauren and Sue, uh, also talk about the challenges? So um, family physicians and pediatricians across the country have absolutely noticed the increase in child and teenage mental health issues. And it's definitely being talked about in our fields constantly. Um, we are we're the first people that parents or kids or teens come to. You know, they don't show up to a therapist or to a psychiatrist. They come to us. And a lot of times, as I was getting to earlier, they don't come to us on time. Um, we know a lot of the people who have participated in these school shootings or other incidents, um, everyone says, oh, I saw it coming, I saw it coming, I saw it coming, but nobody necessarily brought that person to somebody's medical attention, especially the young people. Um, the young people who have done these things have been suffering for years, and people knew it, friends knew it, family knew it, parents knew it. Maybe they didn't know it as much as <coughs> they didn't really think that was going to happen, but we just, we see things so late, and I think that in our job, in my job, I'm trying to get things out of people a little bit sooner. Unfortunately, the people who need the help don't always come, and we don't always know about them, and we just need people, you know, parents, if their kids are having an issue, no matter how small it seems, it seems weird, like, oh, I'm gonna go to my family doctor, I'm gonna go to my pediatrician, bring them in, we have access to get them into other programs, or sometimes it's just sitting down and talking, like Lauren said earlier, it's not always medicine, or it's not always therapy, it's just knowing and talking about things. I've seen so many kids that, you know, I see a lot of kids that tell me that they contemplate suicide frequently. You know, these are kids that you're like, really, seriously? That's something you thought about? And I've told parents, your child is contemplating killing themselves, and they just fall over and they're like, seriously? Like, I knew they were having some issues, but, so it doesn't matter how big or small it is, we need to see these kids, we need to get them in. We need to get them in before they're in full crisis, because I've also seen kids come in where I've had to take them out of school. I mean, I've, I've taken kids out of school for two, three weeks at a time so we can get them kind of control with their anxiety and depression. And that's not, that's not a good time to see them. You know, that's the time when they snap. That's the time when something goes wrong. And again, like the kids that 
have problems, just they don't always, parents don't bring them in. They don't come even for regular checkups. Not all kids come for regular checkups once a year. The school, you know, faculty can often see kids that they have concerns and maybe say, hey, go to your pediatrician or family doctor. So we definitely, you know, we are, fortunately or unfortunately, the first line and people don't always realize that, you know, just go to a psychiatrist or go to a therapist. So my big push is to just, you know, and, and really our big challenge is to get these kids in, get them in, get them in soon enough, get them in, you know, so we can start addressing these issues because no one ever shot up a school that was just a completely normal kid that no one ever thought anything was wrong with. At least not, you know, that I have heard about. There's always someone saying, oh yeah, I knew that. Or you hear about them saying, oh, he's the next school shooter or she's the next school shooter. Well, we don't want to get them at that point. You know, these kids have issues and everybody knows they have issues. So let's get them in, let's get them into the system. Let's get them in into their family <coughs> doctor and just talking about it. You know, that's kind of my passion. And again, as much as I try and pull it out of people, if someone's not telling me something also, I can't always get something out of their kid. Sure, sure. And I guess that's where Penn Foundation comes in. Maybe you can talk about some of the outreach that you sure. are doing. Sure. There's, There's a lot of things that Penn um, Foundation has been doing. I think uh, access is going to be one of the things that I was wondering as a challenge. Yeah. Because I think on top of um, certain mental health issues, it's being underreported in general and people being maybe hesitant to seek help around that. Um, sometimes it can be hard to get to that help, whether it be a transportation issue or an insurance issue or um, any sort of issue. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's something. I mean, there's lots of stuff that can get in the way, sure. especially if you're hesitant about doing something to begin with. I think fear is a big, um, a big challenge. Um, People are afraid if I say this, they're going to think I'm, I'm nuts. Or if I say this, you know, next stop is a hospital, or the next stop is, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get arrested. And um, no, that's not necessarily that's not the next step. You know, we're going to have a conversation. You know, and there's um, there's a, a number of people who are around and wanting to help. Um, I think to kind of to work with the access issues is bringing uh, bringing interventions out to the community. I think raising awareness and panel tonight being able to speak openly about um, things that we're all seeing as challenges and things that we all are seeing as needing to have attention given to. Um, it raises awareness in the community, so having those conversations might not be as hard uh, or as difficult to start. You know, the, the parent or caregiver is seeing a shift in their child. You know, being able to sit down and just talk about that. You know, I'm in trouble. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. I just noticed that, you know, you're not playing soccer. <laughs> he used to really love soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. And just knowing the uh, knowing the different warning signs of, uh, or kind of, yeah, the warning signs uh, of depression comes with anxiety. Um, and being able to decrease the isolation around that. Because um, my own reading about uh, school violence and incidents that I was doing before coming here, isolation was really the main um, standout for me. You know, it wasn't necessarily everyone had a mental health diagnosis. It was they just felt very, very isolated from their community. Mm -hmm. um, they had friends. They had, um, they looked like normal kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you would never know that X, Y, Z had happened or if they were feeling certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I think trying to um, ease the gap and talking about that, having other people <coughs> feel like to say, hey, I think so and so is having a problem. Mm -hmm. um, some ways that we've done that have been fun to answer your question is, is bringing bringing awareness out of the community like I just said um, being able to hold um, groups within schools when it's allowed um, in the sense of we're not pulling kids out of class because education is very important um, but I know that it, being able to identify kids that might need a little extra support you know that they're able to come to talk to someone after their guidance counselor you know they're involved in the mental health um, program that guidance counselor will be able to speak to that mental health professional um, if everyone is okay and it's, you know, again, respecting the privacy rights. Um, I think starting groups is a really great way to help people because it's not necessarily um, an individual therapist. They're able to talk to people, um, peers, have peers within the group, and they can focus on something, they can focus on bullying, they can focus on, I don't know, uh, parents who might be um, addicted you know, and people who are struggling with that, and there's, again, it's not necessarily therapy, um, but it can be therapeutic in the sense that you're connecting with people, because I think that's really what 
household um, resilience um, and some are just to be connected. Sure, they feel like they're knowing that there's help there for them. Thank you. And how about from the law enforcement perspective? You know, you have talked about challenges. Uh, yes, yeah, so I want to echo first what the district attorney said about the challenges of uh, a threat. We want to be preventive in nature. We don't want to, we don't want something to happen to any of our schools or anything in our community. But we have to be cognizant of the fact that it could happen. And I have to, you know, echo his comments because an information we understand is is instantaneous, right? And we want to make sure that we cannot have any other people showing up at a, a, a scene uh, like this. I just want to make sure the community understands that we understand you have children, but let me tell you, I, I can speak for all the officers here and everybody that I work with, we understand the importance of, of, of child safety and, and taking care of our children. Every American child has a right to feel safe in their school. And um, I'm telling you right now, if there's an issue, we're going to handle it. We're going to take care of it. And we're going to be here. And we just want to make sure that people are not responding uh, and, and coming to school and, and creating more chaos. Right? So just keep that in mind. And um, I just wanted to make, make another comment on that. Um, one, of the, one of the other challenges that I see as, as I look at things is I'm nearing 50 years old and I've been working 15 years uh, with the state police and I was a Marine Corps officer. I'm still a Marine Corps officer, but uh, uh, working in the Marine Corps. I, I think we're going to have a problem, um, and this is more of a, a national level type thing, and, I, and we do see it in the state police as well, and I, I think local departments. We're, we're having a problem, I, I think, recruiting and, and getting talented individuals, right, to come and do police work. And I, I don't know why that is. I, I have my own thoughts and ideas at times. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a stigma that's attached or we, we look at media and we see things that have happened into our profession and uh, people are turned off by, you know, going into law enforcement. But I see a challenge there. I see a challenge in recruiting. I see a challenge for our departments in, in manning levels. And uh, I, I think there's, there's probably not enough uh, police officers uh, uh, working, working the streets and not enough uh, quality people applying. And, and there's a stigma, I think, somewhat attached uh, to law enforcement. And I, I think some of that can be corrected uh, through social media. Now, I'm not the greatest social media guy. I mean, I have a Facebook account and, and some things. But I, I think we need to do a better job uh, in, in that arena. Uh, we need to uh, document and, and talk about some of the positive things that the police officers are doing. Uh, across the country, not just in our area. And we also need to be transparent, and we need to be transparent. We need to let people know when we make a mistake, right? And we need to be, provide that information uh, out, out to the public, you know, and, and we need to be held accountable. And I think if we have a good information flow, we also need to show positives and things that we're doing. We need to do something to, uh, you know, make this a, a desirable uh, profession. Because uh, in my mind, I, I think there's a lot of people that aren't interested in doing law enforcement. And uh, that's going to be a challenge. It's not a challenge that's you know, right here, right in front of us right now, but I think that's going to be a challenge uh, in the future, in the near future, hiring quality people uh, to be police officers. So that, I think it's very important. It's very important to our communities. Uh, and it's very important that we have folks upholding, upholding the law and protecting, uh, protecting the people that, uh, in our community. Um, I think that's really, that's, that's about it. That's all I got. But I, I think we can correct some of this by the, uh, we need to you know, create a positive image, right? And I, there's, I know from the guys that work for me uh, that there's so many positive things going on. Uh, and uh, I just want to make sure that we need to do a better job of getting that out to the community. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges that we've always had in a rural community such as ours is implementing a community policing model. Um, we, we strive to develop these informal relationships uh, where citizens and the students uh, have access and, and can trust law enforcement uh, to the point where those relationships can then foster kind of communications where there's threats or some kind of danger and they feel comfortable coming to talk to us. Uh, one way that we've, or, you know, we've, we've, we strive to implement community policing is through the different programs that we run at the school, just being present at the school. I know that I have had um, young adults now who I had in the early 2000s and dare who uh, I don't always recall all of them but they will come, just come up to me you know at the gas station or at wearings and say oh hey how you doing and, and so that means something to them and then sometimes they'll relate a problem to me that they uh, have otherwise uh, you know, expressed to a police officer 
So I think it's important to we continue to foster those relationships. And it, it's, it's important to recognize that the school district is really the hub of this community. Uh, I know that Tenecum Elementary is where the community comes together for the events. It's where the community's children grow. Um, so really in a rural area like ours, uh, Palisades is really the keystone, I think, to the community. So that's why it's so important that we have these kinds of communication and, and meetings that we have tonight and, and everything the school district does for, for um, the greater community. Great. Mike, anything to add for challenges and restructuring? Um, <laughs> challenges, uh, I'll first touch on within our department. Um, Way back when, I won't say dates, but uh, when I was in the police academy, we didn't ever talk about a police officer having to go into a school and to be politically correct using the term neutralizing threat. Call it what it is, going to a school and possibly have to kill a child in order to save them. That's an extremely difficult concept to swallow. Uh, there's a lot of challenges psychologically with even dealing with this topic for law enforcement because while everybody else is trying to shelter in place or evacuate or whatever, we're the ones that are called to go into the school and neutralize the threat. Um, and there's all kinds of data out there as to the um, reaction time. They, one case specifically, they did um, reaction time on targets uh, on, the, on the shooting range where it was just a hostage situation. Uh, where it was a male holding a female hostage with a gun and it was nothing for a police officer to take aim and neutralize the man. Now, and I know in, in our department, we have targets with children on And it sounds pretty crazy that we have to shoot at targets with pictures of children. Um, but what that does is it prepares the officers for the God forbid eventuality of going into a school and having to take aim on a child. And it's extremely difficult to see it on the range, to see the hesitation of the officers, and that's on a target. So we're constantly practicing that. Um, there's absolutely no way to fully prepare mentally for that. Um, it could be career ending psychologically for, for an officer to have to deal with a situation of that magnitude. Um, so it's, Adjusting that mindset for the officers is, is quite difficult. Um, I can't imagine being, being a father myself. I can't imagine having to do it. Uh, hopefully I get through my career and never have to do it, obviously. Um, but going back to the trends, uh, it's not getting, the, the numbers aren't decreasing. That's just the reality of it, hopefully they do. Uh, but they're not at this point. So the chances are increasing that that may happen, um, and that's so that's a huge challenge for us. Um, and and also another challenge on that front is changing the teacher, parent, administrator mindset of um, accepting what we have to do. Um, their job again is to get the children in a safe place. Our job is to commit and neutralize the threat. There's a very delicate balance of understanding between those two. Um, and I think nights like tonight are huge in bridging that uh, and getting to that balance where, where we understand what each side is called to test. It's certainly a very uncomfortable situation, and when you describe what you just had, obviously it um, vividly puts a picture in your mind of the severity yeah. and, and the dire situation that it could be. So um, thanks for reminding us just 
how serious this is. Thank you. And I think the only thing, the only thing I'd want to add is, um, again, from a training perspective, we talked about youth mental health first aid, our teachers being resources, our administrators being resources, all of our staff being resources, to interact with students and be able to recognize um, some signs or concerns that they may have when they see students. But it's also with our administrative team. Um, those certainly that are sitting in the room, in the room um, when they went to school to be a principal or a superintendent, wherever it may be, uh, these types of conversations did not occur. So it's being um, uh, aware of and uh, willing to take the time to do trainings in incident command, NIMS training. Um, our team is great and that's never a question of like, why do we have to do this? Everything is on the table at this point. Um, so there has been training on incident command and that's again, if something happens that all of us um, you know, at this panel right now are talking the same language and we're not wasting time and trying to understand what law, I'm not trying to understand what law enforcement is saying because I've gone through the same, on the same type of training, but at least the language of incident command. Um, also this summer there are administrators in, in the room as I did, participated in training with our emergency management folks for tactical emergency casualty care, which is certainly not um, a training that I thought I would go through, but it is to um, Mike's point at the end of the, of the panel, what happens in the event that there is a horrific accident, or not an accident, but a horrific event in our school, um, how do we go through and provide immediate care, first aid care, um, to those that have been affected. And, um, it, it is extremely sobering training, but necessary, and again, a certain amount of training that I thought that I would be doing when I went into education. Our next question um, had to do with misconceptions, and we've talked a lot about that. Um, what are the, the misconceptions that people have, and what can we do um, you know, to help change those misconceptions? I'm hearing common themes like education, uh, collaboration, um, using or compiling resources for parents, resources for school personnel hearing training, communication, relationship building, very strong themes uh, from the things that all of you have commented on. Um, I thought I'd start with you, Susan and Laura, to see if there's anything else that you'd like to uh, add uh, to that conversation. Um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions just about mental health. We've talked about stigmas and destigmatizing that's only a bunch of people have mentioned that tonight. You know, a lot of people, my family and friends included, when you try and say something like, hey, is this going on with your kid? No, like it's perfect. And it's not, it's like a gut reaction. And, you know, I have kids, I do it. Oh, no, my kid's great, my kid's fine. But my plea would be that, you know, if someone comes to you, if a school person comes to you, if a friend comes to you, if a friend tells their parent, their parent comes to you and says, hey, we were concerned about this kid, not to just brush it off and no, my kid's fine. And that's, that's, there's just, it doesn't mean your kid has some terrible mental health illness and is going to be, you know, on medication and hearing voices and all sorts of, you know, things that you hear about, oh, they're crazy. But just to kind of take it down a notch and be like, okay, you know what? I do want to help my kid. You know, what if there is something? Let me, just to not automatically jump to the conclusion of, they're wrong, my kid's fine. You know, and I see that a lot. And I see it in my office, I'll ask parents, oh no, they're fine. But the parents I have seen come in, you know, kind of exactly like Lauren was saying, that have said something about their kid. You know, he used to do this, he used to do that, or he really doesn't have a lot of friends, and he's really not doing any extracurricular activities. He's sleeping a lot. Um, he comes home from school, goes up to his bed, and goes to sleep. You know, we've actually been able to help some of these just by bringing them in more frequently to see us in the office. I mean, nothing huge or major. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing majorly wrong with them, but it is a very anxiety provoking world. And mm -hmm. school, I was just saying alarm before we started, I can't imagine being a teenager today. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine, I've had enough trauma as a teenager just going through it without social media, but I cannot imagine being a teenager today. And if you notice a difference, or even if you don't, you're busy and you're working, you know, I work a full time job. If somebody told me something about my kid, I hope that I would be the person to not have the gut reaction to say, no, everything's fine. That, you know, 
maybe it's nothing huge, maybe it's something little, but just to bring them out, talk about it with them. If you can't talk about it with them, bring them into somebody and talk about it. But, you know, this is what I do. I do prevention. I do immunizations. We prevent diseases. We prevent cancer. We prevent, you know, heart attacks. Mental health is just as much a disease as everything else, and we want to prevent the things that have happened that are bad that we're talking about tonight, you know, that's scary, that make me nauseous when I think about my three and five year old going to school someday. You know, I want to prevent all those things from happening, and I know I can't, but by just having people be a little bit less reactive to say, oh no, everything's fine, and hear other people, whether it's the school, whether it's friends, whoever, that's, that's my plea, and that's. Thank you, Lauren. I think another another type of misconception might be that um, people are helpless in, in their situation if things have gotten to a place where uh, people are really struggling. Um, I think sometimes um, people seek services and they kind of get. Um, I want to sound fun, fun. and that's going through the motions of going through various services, and I think that lends itself to a sense of, um, like, I'm never gonna get better. You know, this is never gonna change. And it, when you're, if you're struggling, if you're down, or you're really worried about something, or something else is happening, it's really hard to see past that moment, um, to know that this will pass. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think that um, being able to speak to people's resilience, speak to build people's hope, um, is something that everyone can do um, to help, but there's, um, I think that might even be why some people don't seek service, you know, other than not wanting to uh, appear weak or to appear like uh, there's something wrong with them, um, they don't want to feel like there's nothing they can do, you know, they don't want to fail, it, it, it doesn't feel good to fail, you know, it doesn't feel good not to be able to do something that you want to do, so, and they can't really see the light at the end. Yeah, it's, it's hard, it, it, I mean, it's a really, really tough thing to be able to, to see through that. Um, and the other misconception that I was thinking of as we're all talking is that you know all of these different systems who are represented up here tonight um, that we are all working towards the same goal. You know, I think that sometimes um, you know everybody has their own job to do and their own responsibility. Um, but in some conversations, I know I've had there's been like this underlying sense of animosity towards various places, and it, it's not that. You know, we're all here trying to help people be well. Um, and I think the fact that we've all said it already, that we're all here at the same table kind of speaking about the same thing and learning how to get on the same page is so wonderful. Because uh, that's, what, that's what's going to help in the long run. So uh, everyone is here to help. Great, thank you. Can you have John want to address the issue of misconception? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll continue just bring forth some of the things that, that I appreciated. Um, the Lord just talked about people who do recover. So we want to make sure that the people in the community do. On we, we see we see it we see it every day. People do get better. People do recover with help. Um, and I think it's important again tonight as we're having this conversation with mental health professionals and school safety that we recognize that the huge majority of folks um, suffering from mental health issues are nonviolent. Have to make that point that, that mental health does not equal violent crime. That most violent crime is committed not by people with mental health. We just have, uh, you know, I, I don't know if my wife watches Criminal Minds on the loop by think on whatever channel it's on. We go back and forth through Criminal Minds and Law and Order. And, you know, everybody says we hear voices and they all become violent offenders. And so we just have to get that picture of people with mental health out of our heads. And that, that is, you know, most violent crime is not committed by people. People with mental health, a very large, large majority are, are nonviolent. So, your advice is turn off the television. <laughs> no, I, mean, I can watch what I want in other rooms. And the last point, just point I'll make is, is again, there are uh, people to help. There are very many caring people and a physician in school, all the agencies I work with. Um, there, there's a lot of caring people out there to help with. There's a, a misconception that people are. Alone, and there's nowhere to call. I mean, there, there is a lot of resources. We, that is one thing we are as a community. Um, and, and, and we have a little conversation earlier that it's harder. In this part of the county, I know people are sort of far apart, and it's a big geographical area. But there are resources, there are people that care, there are people that want to help. Yeah, 
Thank you. Uh, I think the biggest misconception that most people have is that the school was unsafe. The school was very safe. Probably one of the safest places to be, one of the safest places to send your kids. That's the first point. The next point I want to make, <clears throat> I don't ask the young people in the audience, put your earmuffs on. Mm -hmm. um, misconception I think that we now have is that we, we tend to treat our kids like little mini adults. And in some way, we, we, we've given over this autonomy to our kids. Uh, this is the earmuffs part. You are allowed to look in your kids' rooms. You are allowed to check your kids' social media. You are allowed to meet your kids' friends. And you are allowed to be very actively participating in your child's lives. You should be communicating with them every day. You should be uh, doing all of those things that I've just given you permission to do. Uh, and I'm guilty if that is the word that you use of those very things. And if you'd be amazed at what you will learn about your child if you're an active and a passive uh, participant in their lives. So um, the last thing that I, I will mention, and this goes along how safe school is, goes to the dangers that your children will face will not come from something that happens in a physical plant of school, but probably will, have, will be much more insidious and that will be online, either via a, a predator, God forbid, because the, we are not monitoring their chats or their chatting with or their meeting online, or they could be, uh, and this is uh, just relentless, they could become a victim of bullying and the pile of wrong that occurs. And we really have to try to be very active and nip that in the bud because more often than not, it's not the, uh, the, the bully that um, takes that bottom approach or the aggressive action, but it's, the, it's that poor kid that can't take it anymore that doesn't know what else to do, hasn't had the resources to turn to to try, try to get some help, and then they take matters into their own hands in those rare occasions. And they're the ones we end up locking up in juvenile court for these retaliatory threats. And that's really not the people that we, that, that's not what we had in mind in the first place, of course, but we have an obligation to protect everybody. So there's just three missing Thanks. Do you mind if I add to that? Sure. I mean, the bullying thing I think is huge, and we do, a lot of the time when parents come in with concerns to me, and my kid's not going out, my kid doesn't have friends, my kid's sleeping in the room all night, I'm not diagnosing that kid with anxiety or depression. I'm getting further into what might actually be going on. I always ask, is something going on at school? Is something going on with bullying this, you know? And, and most of us as pediatricians and family docs, if someone comes into us, we are, you know, especially with concern going into that, and see it to let the kids admit to us that they're being bullied. And it's not because they don't that are being bullied. The parents come in and tell us they're being bullied. And my best friend's son was a victim of it online in school, ended up getting beat up. I mean, really, really serious, significant stuff from a kid who is bullied. And, you know, if you see a change in your kid, it may not be that they're mentally ill, but that something's happening. And that's, you know, I think that's important to get out there too. And that, Again, bringing them in, even if it's to us, even if it's to the school counselor, it doesn't have to be to the doctor, it could be to anybody. And, hey, you know, something's going on with my kid. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what comes out of that is that they're being bullied. Let me just confirm, you don't live in this area. I do not. <laughs> and my best friend lives in North Carolina, so. <laughs> that happened very far from here. <laughs> uh, Mike, I'll, I'll kick it to you so you don't have to answer last <laughs> I think I've, I've felt, at least, that um, one of the big misconceptions about police in schools equals there's a problem in that school, right? And I think what people have to understand is the reason police are in the schools is not to be a disciplinary. It's not to see how many kids we can lock up. Um, it's yet another outlet for these kids to talk. Um, it's amazing to walk around, in our case, in the elementary school, and the children are hanging on our coattails, just begging to tell us something. Most of the time it is quite comical, um, but a lot of the time I think the children 
kind of intuitively relate us as someone that fixes problems, right? So in their mind, we're the person they're gonna go to to express a problem. I've got a problem with person X, or I've got a person with or a problem with this at home, whatever. Um, especially at the, at the elementary level. Um, so again, I think one of the most, the biggest misconceptions about police in general in the schools, whether it be uh, a police officer that's assigned to the school in an SRO type um, capacity or just us walking through the halls. Um, the reason we're there is not because there's a problem in the school. The reason we're there is to gather information um, and, and just be an outlet for these children to yet another outlet for them to express their concerns or issues. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned before, the whole piece of relationship building and trust, that's huge. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Matt? I think an important misconception to correct for, regarding how police respond to mental health incidents. So I think a lot of family members are a little leery about calling 911 or calling for help when their family loved one is in some kind of mental health crisis because they fear that the only outcome is that they're going to end up in a facility or you know worse than jail. Uh, I think over the last decade or so, there's been a big push for um, officers to kind of get some basic training in crisis intervention. And I know Bucks County has provided that to a large percentage of officers. Um, proud. Our officers are really good at de-escalating these types of situations. And our primary focus when we call to these incidents is to first de-escalate the situation, uh, make sure everybody's safe, of course, but then also try and find out what kind of resources we can bring to the table. Um, we're not therapists, we're, uh, but often we have the resources to get the therapists there. Um, and some of the county providers have mobile teams that we've utilized, and that's been great because people are often um, reluctant to go to a hospital to get checked out, but they'd be willing to have somebody come out and talk to them. So we, we use that resource. That's one resource that's available. Um, and if nothing else, we can walk the family members through the process of what, uh, whether it's an involuntary commitment because it's that serious, but it often ends up being a voluntary commitment. So we also just get out there, they talk to the individuals. Um, maybe the mobile person, mobile team comes out and they work with them as well and they get them the resources. The resources are there. So our main goal is to really be a referral. We're not trying to incarcerate people who are going through a mental health crisis. Um, you know, we'll do what we have to do to keep everybody safe. But our primary goal is to get them the help that they, uh, that they need, which is finding them in a crisis. Yeah, I have to agree with a uh, colleague to my left when we're talking about mental health. Um, you know, we do have a, a concern. Uh, you know, I, was, I was looking at a few statistics before uh, tonight and uh, actually last night, and uh, most, which, I was, which was alarming to me, which is I thought a little higher than I expected, but you know, nationally about 10% responses were, were dealing, 10% of the police calls in the United States were dealing with uh, mental illness of some sort. And I, you know, before I came here today, I just kind of checked with uh, you know, my numbers at, at Dublin, and, and over the last three months, we've, uh, we've had 18 uh, you know, mental health uh, type of uh, commitments, right? 302 commitments where uh, we determined necessary, either the officer or the uh, family member determined it was necessary that, that their loved one or, or person that they cared about uh, receive some care, receive some help. And you know, it, it's a challenge because, um, you know, like Matt said, uh, we are not uh, trained in, in, in diagnosing or mental health uh, uh, type issues, but if we want to facilitate, we want to help people. I mean, I, I don't, and I, I go back, we're not there to arrest folks. We, we want to, we get called to a scene, and it brings up a great point. We're there to de-escalate things. We're, we're, we're a calming influence, right? But, you know, also keep in mind, when my officers show up or troopers show up on scene, you know, I'm concerned about their officer safety, right? They're going to handle business accordingly. But uh, you know, we, we want to help people, okay? Uh, we're not arresting these folks, right? So, you know, 
it's incumbent upon people that uh, you, you have a loved one or, or care. But you know, the issue is it's unfortunate that we have this mental health problem and, and, and the first responders, the police officers end up being, you know, the first people to become aware of it, right? And, and it would be better, obviously, if um, family members were helping along the way, getting their you know, loved ones or the people they're concerned about care prior to the responders showing up. But we will do everything in our power and, and abilities to, uh, to facilitate care, right? But we're not providing any care. I mean, we're going to find the right avenue of approach right, to ensure that people are safe, right? And we, we are in the business of de-escalate. Or we don't escalate situations. We want to de-escalate. Uh, that's, that's, that's about it. Thank you. Just, I, I'll just let the audience so I appreciate um, Chief Family mentioning the crisis intervention team training that the county does. So uh, in Bucks County, we've trained, this is the whole county, not just this area, but 361 police officers have been trained in this crisis intervention model. And it's um, it's not like a two-hour training. That's a full week, a full day training. So kudos to the departments that have been sending officers and, and giving up all the time to be able to participate in the CIP training. We've also trained um, 911 uh, dispatchers and also corrections officers in this uh, model to and try to learn to recognize mental health and de escalate situations. Thank you. Thank you. Is there one last thought anyone would like to throw out there before we? We're going to have a hard stop at 8 o'clock. Um, I just wanted to share um, that on our district website, we also have resources for anyone in the community. I just want to make you aware that they're there. Um, if you have a family member in crisis, whether it's your child or a parent or a sibling or whatever the case may be, um, we have resources on our website to help you get the help that you may need. Um, certainly con contacting 911 may be appropriate, but I want to make sure that you're aware um, that there are resources there as well for you. And we'll move them to the front of our page for a little bit. So um, those in the audience can find what they need. And I also wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to share about Crime Watch. 15 second pitch, these cards are out on the table uh, with a lot of the other resources. Take one if you want to know what's going on in your community. Bucks County Crime Watch, one stop shopping. And if you want to leave us an anonymous tip, obviously if you have a crisis situation, call 911. If you want to leave an anonymous tip, you can do so on our Crime Watch page. But this is a great app for your phone as well. In terms of, my name is Denise Rue, and I live a couple doors down from here. And I have a child in middle school. And uh, I'm also a certified industrial hygienist working in CP emergency response. And one of my colleagues, I work in New Jersey, and they're in the, they live in Clinton. And one of the trends that they were telling me about, some of the security people, and also he was telling about, me about that the trend is actually to have officers hire part-time police officers and always have them within the school for the reasons that you mentioned, to get to know the students, and then that's a new trend. So my question is, has the school board thought about this, and have you heard about this through the Clinton uh, Police Department? Yes, so the state of Pennsylvania has long allowed for either school resource officers, but now they've changed. There's an Act 44, which is in this summer, and they've changed some of the definitions, so you can have a school resource officer that's affiliated with um, mm -hmm. a township or school your township or local police or a school police officer in your um, building so the district would uh, have a police force and there are districts that do have that. Um, I think Logan in Bethlehem has a school police force. I think uh, North Penn perhaps have sort of your bigger districts. The question is has the school board considered or had a discussion regarding school resource officers and to this point not a full board discussion on that issue. Okay. All right, thank you, Mrs. Thank you again. Thank you. I know there's another question. Thank you. My name is Michelle Haney. I live here in Rockinson Township. Thank you all for what you do in the lives of children. 
from a national perspective, some schools are implementing would be safe pods in classrooms, um, armed teachers, um, even uh, metal detectors in the front. I wanted to know if we had considered any of those options. And I am also a um, licensed foster parent, and one of the things that we do teach or, or taught is resilience and teaching our children about being resilient because I think teaching about anti-bullying is not working. And so then I wanted to see what the school board had thought on some of those aspects as well. Um, so our take this thing too. Um, so our school board has been discussing issues of safety in and most recently our facilities committee meetings, which were public meetings. Um, again, I'm gonna mention Act 44 only because it's new. There are some um, well, a lot of issues related to safety that can be discussed in executive session um, because you don't necessarily want to publicly share what your vulnerabilities are or what um, pieces that you have in place. So um, to your question about metal detectors, there are some things that are obvious. So obviously we do not have metal detectors. Um, I just want to like a thought going forward because I know we've talked about shutting schools down and some of our schools not really being far. Or like just in the last year that I've lived here, that going forward with construction, I'm sure that there's some things that need to be changed in our schools. Since you mentioned that this one is this building itself is 25 years old, so like you're looking at improving or some of these things, improvements that we've been looking at. Yeah. So we have gone through uh, physical plant changes, some of which I mentioned as far as the office as you're coming in. Now we have sidelines going out and we work with our local law enforcement and state um, folks and other members of the community to look at new walkthroughs to give us suggestions as to what, what to do to improve. So it's an ongoing conversation um, with our school board and with our administrative team and with many of the folks that are sitting up on the panel discussion. What about the arm of our teachers? Because I know, like, right here, we don't have the local police force, we don't have an understanding, we just have um, the yeah. state police. Correct. And arm in our teachers has not been a discussion among the school board members either. Thank you. One further clarification that I'd like to let you know you may be interested in is we meet with uh, most of these folks on a pretty regular basis, so at least twice a year. Mm -hmm. Um, we convene a, a, a community group. It includes first responders, uh, legislators, legislators, and we're talking about these issues regularly. Um, so, and those conversations are then carrying over to school board as I'm aware um, in executive session. So, just so that you're aware of that. okay. Thank you. Okay. One last question, and then we will stop. Uh, my name is Catherine, and I'm from Bridgeton Township, and I want to thank all of you for coming in. To the police officers, our children tell us when they are in the school. They come home, they're excited, from, you know, younger up to middle school. Um, in fact, they're sitting here right now, <laughs> like embarrassed, but they, they love to see you. They love to hear about everything that you're teaching them, and it's just really instilling you know, that you're not just there when something's wrong, but you're their friend and you're there to go to. Um, and that didn't happen when I was in school so long ago. So thank you for that. Um, to our medical experts, thank you uh, for everything that you said today. Same thing, we weren't taught, trained to talk like that when we were younger. So everything that, that you brought to the table today is excellent. Um, these meetings that we were just talking about the facilities meeting. Um, we talked about safety, and they are public meetings, and I hope that the parents start to show up when they have some questions or concerns. The school board meetings, they're public meetings. It's hard to get to them, but um, if it's important to you, come and speak up about it. Um, obviously, there's so much going on. Um, and then just my one question would be for, again, these, um, things that the schools have been putting in place, all the changes here to this school, to Tinnicum, to Springfield, they're constantly changing, it's just the environment. Um, I'd like to ask that consideration be made that in the evening when these events are going on and children are in the school from 2.37 till 9 o'clock at night, that the school doors are not wide open and unmonitored 
at the middle school and high school. It's really something that if it's important during the day, it's important at 545. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Thank you, panelists, for being with us this evening. Before I close tonight's event, I do have to say thank you, of course, to Dr. O'Connor for hosting this event. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely an open experience, and we're happy that everyone was able to come out. And I'm glad thank you for having this idea to bring this together. I'm going to embarrass Tina Crump. And I'm going to thank her and Mr. Klingbeil for covering all of our bases this evening. Thank you for the setup. Thank you for handing up the details. Thanks, Giandotti, for being our sound and light man. We appreciate that very much. You always do a great job for us as to as to be around and Dina. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. I hope you have an important takeaway from tonight. Thanks for uh, indulging me this evening. And, and again, thank you everybody. It's great to have you here this evening. Appreciate it.